Jasmine Myers, a 2018 Alfred University graduate with a BA in Environmental Studies and a Global Studies minor. Uh, after AU, Jasmine went on to Binghamton University where she earned a master's in sustainable communities and a certificate in genocide and mass atrocity prevention. Um, I think she had a good experience with that master, so feel free to um, ask about it or contact. Hey, um, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Feel free to contact Jasmine after. She'll, she'll mention our contact info or on LinkedIn for information about that. <laughs> we haven't seen Nadine in a while either, so it's great. Jasmine's first position right after graduating from AU was for a large engineering, engineering firm on a remediation project at the Hanford nuclear site in Washington state. She then came back to her native Rochester, where she worked as a planner on an urban mobility project. She started working for the city of Rochester in 2023, where she is now senior zoning analyst as staff to the city planning commission. So I'll uh, leave it to you. Thanks for coming and visiting us. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, I'd really like to keep this a bit of an open discussion. I'll use my PowerPoint here, um, you know, to go along and kind of hit certain topics. Um, but you would be surprised that after you graduate, you really don't use PowerPoint anymore. So this goes. So of course, um, Fred gave me a great introduction. Uh, today I'll be talking about zoning and how land use planning can help create sustainable communities. So Fred gave me um, a little bit of a background intro here, but I was an um, AU student. I graduated in 2018. My major was environmental studies and I did a minor in global studies. So after I graduated, um, I felt a little bit lost and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I moved across the country with no money and no place to live. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't in Washington that I eventually landed a ship opportunity and worked um, at Health Hanford Works Nuclear Waste Site. So um, I'll show a video, but Hanford is a really interesting place. There is a lot of history surrounding it, and there is a lot of pollution. Um, after being um, after Alfred and Moving uh, to Washington, I moved back and I went to Binghamton. I got my master's in sustainable communities where I focused on urban planning. I did my graduate thesis on uh, healthy food options in urban environments. And I also got my certificate in genocide and mass atrocity prevention. So I'm gonna show a video and I'm hoping that it loads correctly. So I just wanted to show that video um, coming from a place where my interests heavily align with history and how communities have been affected by that history. Um, it's something that I hold dear to my heart. And I, I love that my current job allows me to, you know, be involved in history in my community. So moving on. I wanted to um, kind of jump into the realm of sustainability here. There are three pillars of sustainability. Um, some argue that there are four, but there's environmental, social, and economic. So when we look at sustainability indicators for environmental, it could be pollution, it could be climate change, loss of biodiversity, and then of course, production and consumption of goods. I think of fast fashion. For social, there's uh, Poverty, socioeconomic inequality, discrimination, social capital, and civic engagement. And for economic, there is access to education, healthcare, and job opportunities, financial stability on a macro scale, equitable allocation of resources, and innovation. So I just wanted to show this graphic. Um, this was something that we were shown in uh, one of my classes when I was at Binghamton. Um, and I'll just give you a second to kind of 
digest it. Um, for inequality, we can see unequal access to opportunities, right? So the person on the right side is kind of like, hey, what about me over here? Um, if you move down for equality, it's the even distribution of tools and assistance. Um, then we move over to equity, custom tools that identify and address inequality. So a lot of people get hung up on equity. I personally like the idea of justice, right? So this is implementing long-term strategies to ensure that um, you know, communities are able to be resilient and sustainable long-term. So the field of planning, I could, you know, give an entire hour long presentation on this. You could go to for an entire graduate degree on this. So I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, but planning and public input is a big part of what we do in zoning. Zoning is very public facing. Um, every day we're dealing with community members. Every day we're dealing with developers um, or we're just there to answer questions to people. Um, who might not know anything about zoning, because most people don't. So when planning, um, if it's done well, it really has the opportunity to bring a community together to establish a shared vision and long-term goals. And there are a lot of moving pieces. So some questions that you can ask when you're thinking about you know, planning in your community would be, do neighbors have convenient opportunities to meet one another? Are shopping areas inviting? Um, can some daily needs be met by walking or biking or any other form of active transportation? Um, is walking, biking, rolling safe? Um, where do people like to gather? Can we get there without driving? And then what are the resources that truly define a community um, that need to be protect protected and made more accessible? So every community is different. A lot of it has to do with how it was planned in the first place. Zoning, uh, the zoning typically changes every 20 to 25 years. So right now in the city of Rochester, our zoning code and our zoning map is from 2003. A lot has changed since then. Um, in 2003, in the city of Rochester, people were leaving. Um, so a lot of areas were what we call down zoned into residential districts. Um, and that has caused problems today. So uh, zoning 101, the zoning code and the zoning map are tools, a planning tool that a municipality uses to implement the goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan is a long range plan. Um, oftentimes it involves many other smaller plans, uh, whether they be active, active transportation plans, environmental plans, you name it. Um, and it is the vehicle for guiding growth and patterns of development in a thoughtful, purposeful, and sometimes creative way to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its residents, business owners, and visitors. So I've included a graphic here of the city of Rochester. Um, and you can see, and this is the same for many communities out there, um, certain districts are, are categorized by different symbology. Oftentimes you have the urban core, and as you move out, it gets to be more residential, single family, um, sometimes townhouses. So the city of Rochester um, is currently in the process of updating its zoning map. The process is called ZAP or the Zoning Alignment Project. Um, and this, is, this has been spurred from a recent update to the comprehensive plan. So I wanted to show a quick video um, we have been very involved with it. It is a multi-year process. There are, uh, there's public engagement meetings. There are a lot of revisions that are made. Um, and every single comment, Rochester has been very diligent in this. Every single comment that is submitted about ZAP is being addressed in a long document. <laughs> so I'll show this video really quick. Between so, uh, why zoning? To implement the comprehensive plan, to protect private and public investment, to ensure compatibility of uses, to ensure compatibility of building design, types, and location, 
to protect the city's tax base and to protect historic, cultural, and scenic resources. Um, zoning definitely is experiencing um, some some hate right now. Uh, I know if just if you just want to look it up, like I know a lot of communities um, around the United States are currently um, implementing what we call um, like no no parking requirements. Um, parking is one of those things that definitely can impact businesses in a community. So that's just one example. Um, we hear about it all the time. So zoning can incentivize land use and services, increase green space and protect undeveloped areas, create more walkable neighborhood, create more walkable neighborhoods. Um, and that can be done through tools like placemaking, encourage input from communities, but it can also limit flexibility and indiv individuality and increase costs of development. Um, oftentimes in zoning, the, the requirements of going through the process um, in any government can definitely lengthen the time of uh, having approvals and increase the costs. So the video that I showed mentioned the, the zoning code. So um, communities are regulated by the zoning code and the zoning map. And the zoning map breaks uh, neighborhoods into different types of development. So there's residential, there's R1, R2, and R3, that's low density, medium density, and high density, um, different intensity, commercial districts, industrial, downtown, or the urban core. And then there are also um, planned development districts or, or urban renewal districts. So zoning regulates uses, accessory uses, accessory structures, parking, setbacks, site design, such as landscaping or screening, building design, heights, transparency, types of materials that can be used, and hours of operation. Zoning does not regulate uh, nuisances, how someone operates their business and what they sell, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, all of that is regulated by the state. Um, anything in the public right-of-way, the public right-of-way is uh, usually between the sidewalk and to the street. Um, deed restrictions or private easements, county, state, or federal property, New York State public authorities, public schools, and railroad property. So we have a saying in our office that zoning regulates the land and not the operator. So um, oftentimes people will come in and they have this development idea. And um, we can get a pretty good sense of, you know, if they've done their due diligence, if they've hired an architect or an engineer, and if they've really put thought into how they're going to operate their business. Um, and that's all fine and well, but let's say that operator leaves and a new operator moves in because we've issued approvals. Who's to say that the new operator is going to operate under the same parameters as the last, um, the last individual? So we really have to remind ourselves in our office that, um, you know, we're dealing with the use of land, not the operator. So I wanted to show some examples here uh, of some screenshots from the city of Rochester. Um, not all of them are very good. So this is an existing auto use. This is in a residential district. And um, oftentimes auto uses do receive some type of site, site plan review process, which I'll get into later on. Um, but we can see that, you know, obviously this is not looking so great. Uh, there's cars that are, you know, double parked, they're encroaching into the sidewalk. And this really creates um, challenges for people who, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're, um, they're wheeling around or maybe there's um, some, some traffic concerns, um, people don't feel safe when they're crossing. So this is just one example. This is another example. In Rochester, there are a lot of properties like this. Um, this was a fun one that we had in our office recently. Um, so in residential districts, right, especially the R1, which is low density, it's typically classified by single family homes, um, detached homes such as pictured here or single family attached homes. So in low intensity districts, there are really, there's not really a lot of um, room to move around in terms of what you can do. 
um, with the land. So we had an individual come in, of course, done all of this work without getting a permit or talking to the city first, um, but they've installed a parking lot next to their house. So someone comes and they say, oh, I got this ticket because I have, you know, cars on my land, it's my house. And our first question is, well, why do you need a parking lot? You know, it's a single family home. Um, there are certain restrictions to how much parking you can have in a single family home. So it just, right? They're saying, oh, well, we're operating our contracting business out of our house. So we have our trucks coming and, coming and parking. We have our employees park here. Um, you can see in the back that they've actually built a deck on top of two storage containers. Would not recommend this. Um, and, you know, sometimes we are, we're baffled by things that come into our office, but it's really important to remember that the majority of people, they don't know anything about zoning. People think it's my land. I should be able to do what I, I want with it. Um, so when projects come in, it's not just the zoning code. Um, it is also building code. It's fire code. There are a lot of moving parts, as I've mentioned before. So we are working with this individ individual. I don't know how far they're going to get with us, but I just thought that this was funny and a good example. Um, here's another example. This is actually one of my favorite houses in the city. They have great landscaping in the front. Um, you can see that they've, uh, you know, they've taken to really kind of make this like a cohesive looking property. Um, and I just, I just love that house. So I thought I'd throw it in. I came across this last night. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, modern zoning laws make your Christmas village illegal. You may think your miniature Christmas village is a quaint tribute to the building traditions of yesteryear. However, its walkable, mixed-use, architecturally diverse layout is a flagrant violation of modern zoning laws. Um, so I included this in here, um, guess the zoning district. Oftentimes, individuals will come into our office and they'll say, um, what do you mean I, you know, I, I can't have a, a retail store? Um, I see a 7-Eleven or I see a, a auto repair shop down the street. And we have to remember that zoning has existed for decades. So as communities, they grow, they change, right? Zoning changes as well. So this property specifically, this is one that I've been working on. Um, this is in a residential district. This is in an R1 low density district that's, you know, primarily single family homes. Now, in this case, this building has probably been there 70 years, right? So these types of properties are what we call nonconformities. Um, I deal with nonconformities. We have a, a process of reestablishing them in the city. Um, but we can see that, you know, that the site is kind of designed in this way. It's not very, it's not done very well. Um, typically auto uses today in the city of Rochester, they are required to have landscaping in the front. They're required to have designated parking areas. I mean, all of this comes into play when we're reviewing a property um, for use, whether it's parking lot maneuverability, um, signage is a big one. So, you know, when people come into our office, I just, I, I try to get them away from the thought of, well, that's happening down the street. Really, it doesn't matter. Um, because, again, we have these nonconformities that have been there for 60 years, and they're probably not going to change. It's not very sustainable to think that someone's going to you know, demolish this gas station, do all the environmental processes, all the environmental cleanup to build a single family home. Um, so this is one of the challenges that we face in our office. So I included here a photo of a typical site plan. Um, we have a permit review uh, counter that's open to the public three days a week. And it allows individuals to come in, ask us questions related to zoning. Oftentimes we hear, well, I just bought this property. What can I do with it? Right? So um, we receive 
applications in. Oftentimes they have survey maps, um, they have easement agreements, they have site plans, um, landscaping plans, floor plans, elevation plans. Um, and we are reviewing all of it at once. Um, our zoning code is over 400 pages. I looked, I'm pretty sure Alfred's is like 40. So, uh, so you know, obviously larger cities out there, the it's going to be longer. There are 208 sections in our zoning code and we review every single one of them on a daily basis. So again, you know, I mentioned my love for uh, history. I think that working in zoning is a, is a great opportunity to be involved in that. Um, sometimes, especially say with the nonconformities, we're looking at permit history, we're looking at property history, we're looking at maps sometimes that are 100 years old, we're looking at sandboard maps, um, and the city has a flagging system um, that's been implemented that will um, tell us when there are any type of um, environmental conditions that need to be addressed. So um, again, with the permitting process, there are uh, certain paths forward um, if a project comes to us and we deem for any reason that it's not approvable or may require waivers um, because it doesn't meet certain sections of the code. So there are land use boards. Alfred has them as well. There's the Zoning Board of Appeals. This deals with variances, oftentimes around physical characteristics or uh, numerical characteristics like setbacks. There are use variances. Um, this is, you know, say it's a, a commercial, low intensity commercial district, and I don't know, uh, building a nightclub isn't allowed. Well, there's the use variance process um, where a applicant can show financial data. We call it proof of hardship to say, hey, you know, I've, I've owned this property for 10 years um, and I'm just not making any money. And that's something that the Zoning Board of Appeals reviews. Um, the City Planning Commission, this is the board that I staff. We review specially permitted uses. So the zone in the zoning code um, for each district, there are uh, permitted by right uses. There are specially permitted uses, which are thought to be permissible, but may have, um, they may have negative impacts on a community. Um, and then we also review uh, amendments. So this is a big one right now for the city of Rochester, because when we do implement our new zoning code and our zoning map, um, you know, this is going to go through rounds of amendments. Um, oftentimes you see them 10, five or 10 years after uh, the code is finalized. There's also the preservation board. Rochester has a lot of, um, a lot of preservation neighborhoods. Um, any exterior work that is done in those neighborhoods does require approval by uh, the Preservation Board, and they have separate set of standards that they're looking at that overrides um, the design guidelines in our zoning code. And then we also have the Environmental Commission. So uh, I'll get into this, but um, we have a process called Site Plan Review. Um, there are certain triggers in the zoning code that do trigger the site plan review process. Um, and sometimes projects will go in front of the environmental commission for review prior to going to one of the um, other land use boards. So other zoning processes include um, seeker. We deal with this uh, very regularly, the certificates of nonconformity, which I've already mentioned. And we also have a, an administrative adjustment process, which is like a light variance, right? Say the um, lot coverage requirements are 50% or less. Well, if you're within a numerical standard of 10%, which is five, um, then you know, you can maybe apply for this administrative adjustment, which is an internal review process. It does not require going in front of a land use board. Um, and we kind of use that to our advantage, right? A lot of people, they don't want to go, um, they don't want to go in front of a land use board. Um, neighbors within 600 feet of the property are notifi notified via postcard. 
They're required to post a sign um, and people don't really want to do that. So we kind of use that as a bartering system to bring projects closer to compliance. Sometimes it, it just doesn't work. Um, parcels, you know, they're oddly shaped sometimes. Maybe a project can't meet a setback requirement. Um, and that's why we have these processes to um, offer waivers from the code. So I'm going to get into the environmental review aspect of projects. Um, there is the National Environmental Policy Act. Rochester also has, um, well, New York State um, has the, has Seeker, right? So this is what um, the city, the, the process that kind of starts our environmental review. And there are a lot of actions here um, that a local government can undertake that requires seeker. And that could be allocation of city money for a project, um, the sale of real estate, issuance of a demolition permit, a site plan decision, variances, um, amending the city code, and um, any decision to adopt a plan um, like the comprehensive plan, that's Rochester 2034. So the seeker process, really the purpose of it is to incorporate consideration of environmental factors into existing planning and discretionary decision making um, in hopes to uh, make revisions to, to processes uh, at the earliest possible time. So seeker's definition of the environment is the physical conditions that will be affected by a proposed action, including land, air, water, minerals, flora, fauna, noise, resources of agriculture, archeological, historic, or aesthetic significance, existing patterns of population, distribution or growth, existing community or neighborhood character, and human health. So this aligns nicely with the three pillars of sustainability. Um, so I just wanted to throw that definition in there because oftentimes when people think of the environment, they're not also thinking of the social aspect of our communities. So in the seeker process, there are three types of actions. There's type one actions, um, which are more likely to require the preparation of an environmental impact statement. There's type two actions. These have been determined to not have a significant impact on the environment. Um, once that has been determined, then a, a project leaves uh, the seeker process. There's also unlisted actions. Um, and these are projects that don't really fall into either type one or type two, but may require additional. So um, type one actions, um, all involved agencies are required to be coordinated in this review process. Um, a long form EAF is required. I'm not gonna get into all of that um, today, but if you have additional questions about that, you can always um, contact me. Uh, and we also must refer these types of actions to the right, Rochester Environmental Commission. Um, extra filing requirements are uh, for environmental determinations are part of that process. There are type two actions, again, not requiring any further environmental review. Um, and then unlisted actions, this is a big one. Uh, they do not, we do not need to coordinate with involved agencies outside of city government, but we also, but we do have to involve um, other departments um, who may want to comment on certain projects. Um, and this can result in either a positive declaration, which is the determination that something will have a significant environmental impact or a negative declaration um, that it will have no to minimal impact. Um, so site plan triggers, they could be type one, type two or enlisted. And that's why it's really important for staff members um, to, to have a careful review of projects when they come in. Things can get missed, right? Um, sometimes you have someone come to the permit counter and they want to repair their porch. And then other times people want to put a concrete batch plant, right? 200 feet from a residential district. So it definitely keeps us on our toes. Um, this is a snippet from the code 
Here are some of the site plan review triggers. Um, parking lots over 10 spaces that don't meet design requirements. This is a big one that we uh, deal with in our office. Um, any new construction on a vacant parcel of one acre or more, uh, projects within 100 feet of a waterfront, new construction of multifamily dwellings, um, new advertising sign structures. So there are 19 of them in all. Um, and there's also major and minor site plan uh, review triggers. So I don't want to bore anyone by going, you know, super deep into the zoning code. Again, 400 pages or more. Um, so I just wanted to include here some ways that you can get involved. Um, every community has long range plans, whether they're on transportation, they're on placemaking, or even just the comprehensive plan. It benefits you to read up on it and know what's happening in your community and really understand what you know five or 10 or 15 years from now might look like for your community. Um, research zoning laws and updates, review the zoning code. You don't have to do that one, um, but you know we do it every day in our office. So uh, you know I didn't have much experience reading that much in depth um, in a zoning code. I definitely had some experience in gra grad school. Um, but if you're interested in things like parking lot design or building design, and you wonder, you're, you're driving down the street or you're walking down the street and you think, how did that get there? That doesn't look like it belongs. Look up the zoning code. Um, and then attend a zoning board or a planning board meeting. Alfred has them. I encourage you to go to one. It's not the most interesting thing that you could be doing, um, but it's it's fun, right? It's, it's interesting to hear um, what people are proposing, people who want to invest money in your community, and then also people who are there to um, provide input. Um, all of that, I think, is, is beneficial to anyone that you know, works or goes to school in any community. So that's, that's my presentation. Um, I wanted to. Hi, yeah, so I was wondering a lot of people like um, kind of the mixed use area is kind of ideal. I mean, you see them a lot in historical walkable cities where, you know, you have the corner store and then the owners are living above it. Is there room for that in modern day zoning codes? Is that something that your agency would support or what do you think about that? Um, yeah, so of course, you know, the updates to our zoning code, we're definitely trying to fix some of the issues that the 2003 update um, caused. And again, it's important to remember that 25 years ago, the community looked a lot different. So um, this down zoning occurred in, in many of these mixed use nodes, intersections, uh, they're in close proximity or maybe there's residential surrounding them. Um, and that has created a lot of these non-conforming properties. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, every community should definitely um, try to update their zoning code to allow more mixed uses. Um, at one point in time, people wanted you know, a, a corner store or a coffee shop or whatever the case may be. Maybe they wanted an auto repair business, you know, two blocks away. Um, communities were just a lot more close knit. And I think with the increase that, or, you know, this change into like car centric environments, um, we've lost a lot of that. Um, especially with COVID people, you know, communities and people themselves, they seem a lot more disconnected. And I think that's why this public input process is so important um, 
to to better our communities. So yeah, I think I think it's a great idea. I don't personally make those decisions, but I can support those decisions. Yeah, so um, again, with the land use boards, um, this public in input process, it's, it's very strict, right? The code lays out exactly how it has to be done, a certain distance, it's this many days before a project is, be set, to, is set to be heard um, at one of the, the hearings. I think I've seen it be mixed. Um, when people come in and we tell them about this process, I encourage, people always to talk to the neighborhood group, get involved with your neighbors, ask them questions, right? Because the last thing that you want to happen is no comments are received. You don't have any time to, you know, prepare how you're going to debate them. And you have 20 people that show up to the hearing that it's enough to potentially stir the decision into a denial. Um, I think with, at least for the city of Rochester, the um, city planning commission, we don't often issue denials, um, but we do implement pretty strict conditions, whether that be on hours, um, number of vehicles you can store, whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes I'll notice that, you know, with the rise of social media, say a business moves in, we just had a, an alternative bar, come into Rochester, it's the first in Rochester, um, they, util they utilize their following, right? They, they posted an Instagram post and said, you know, make sure you, you email this and come to our hearing. And there was like 20 people that showed up uh, to support them. So um, it's definitely a important part of the process. Do I think that everyone utilizes it how they should? No. So like when this new zoning thing for Rochester is um, finalized and like released, is it only for future planning of like new properties or does it get retroactively applied to communities? And if so, like how do you, you know, get people to change the use of their area? Um, so again, the, the ZAP really intends to, um, upzone a lot of areas. So I just, um, last month there was a gentleman who came and they had a proposal, um, and it was a, a non-conforming property and they were issued by the planning commission, uh, a one year approval where one year from the date of that hearing, they have to come back. Um, and basically reapply to get permanent approval. Well, one year from now, if that finalizes, it, they won't need that approval anymore. Um, so we are actually going to have a period of time, um, we estimate it to be about months, where we are moving through all of the applications that came in prior to the finalization, and then we're kind of holding the rest that come in. Um, we, again, this has been an ongoing thing over the course of years. People have been very involved. Uh, I think there was, I mean, there was tens of thousands of comments. Um, but again, not everybody is interested in zoning. So I'm sure there will be people that, um, they don't know. Right. So for example, one of the changes is currently in our medium density residential district or R2, it allows for single and two family homes. Um, when ZAP finalizes, it will now allow four dwelling units. Um, a lot of people are not happy about that. There seems to be this thought um, in neighborhoods where they want it, they want to protect what they have, right? So 
we, we try to encourage people to look at all of the outcomes that can come from increasing housing options, um, you know, creating a, a, a closer knit sense of community by allowing um, more people to come in who, who might not already fit in that mold. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Hi. Uh, change the land use in some way? Would you create? And uh, they're, you know, part of the development process is receiving federal money for, say, low income housing. That process sometimes it could take years. Um, and that also really drives up the cost um, in our municipality to approve developmental decisions um, because, you know, sometimes they have to do extensions of time on previous approvals that were given or. Um, you know, certain departments request $15,000 plans, right? So I can't really answer the incentive part of it because zoning just doesn't deal with that. Um, people come to our office and they say, oh, you guys are, you know, you guys are stopping housing and this is why, you know, everything's so expensive now. And that's why you have $2,000 single, you know, bedroom lofts downtown. Zoning does not approve housing, right? We, the zoning code implements regulations of what can be done. 90% of the time, there are forms of relief. If, you know, say you're in an R2 and you could build two family home, somebody wants to build multifamily, there's a process for that. Does it mean that it'll get approved? It depends, right? It depends on the, on the public input process. Did that answer your question? Um, what are the consequences for not following zoning? Like say someone with like the lots you showed, the auto parks, um, are there any consequences for them like overflowing or like someone building a three-story, like not three-story, like a three building, uh, how three family dwelling um, in like an R1 kind of thing? fully constructing a building yeah. um, without being caught. Um, so the city has a lot of different departments and a lot of different processes. Um, zoning comes, should come first. Sometimes it comes last, right? Someone has already done the work and now they need to come to our office to legalize work that was done. Um, we do have a uh, enforcement department. They're out there Every officer is, you know, issued a, a little pocket within the city and they're out there doing inspections, right? Um, so sometimes that results in fines. We try to be, we try to work with people, right? I, I've noticed that our staff members in zoning, we try to be understanding. These are everyday people, right? And sometimes they don't have $10,000 to spend on plans. Sometimes they've done the work themselves because they don't have you know, money or the time or the resources to hire somebody to do the work. Um, oftentimes contractors or architects, they will be the ones who are doing the process for them. Um, so yeah, it oftentimes results in fines. There are different levels of fines um, different amounts. I've noticed sometimes if the project has gone completely off track and there's like no way it'll get approved, people just pay off the fines. It could be, uh, it could be going on for 10 years and people just, maybe they pay 
$400 every month instead of, you know, spending all of this money to, to legalize what was done. We can't control that. Um, but we try to be very willing to handhold in a way um, and help people understand that we will be there every step of the way to assist them. Right here. Can you answer this question right here? Oh, you want me to do it? Or... Yeah. Michelle? Yep, she can hear okay. Hello. Uh, good to hear from you. I'm sorry that it's virtual. <laughs> um, our boards oftentimes are everyday citizens. Um, they're required to residency. And I'll just speak on the um, city planning board itself. We have people of all different backgrounds. Like we have somebody who is a real estate investor. We have someone who works in uh, solar. We have uh, another uh, individual who owns a sign company. Um, so one of the members has been serving for, I think like almost 30 years. Um, so oftentimes people will join and they'll stay. That's not always the case, um, but sometimes the um, process of filtering through people, I'm sure it's tough like on my manager um, because a lot of people are busy, right? And um, maybe they don't have time to review 10 cases a month and, and you have to visit every single site and you have to, you know, you have to come with certain questions that you have and you have to, you have to be a decision maker um, on the planning commission um i've noticed that honestly people aren't very the commission members aren't very aware of the zoning code whereas on the zoning board for example oh they know if there's a certain setback they know and they are ready to talk about it um so i hope they answered your question and thanks for joining thanks jasmine Thank you so